It's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Maz E.R. Mosheri, DMD, MS. He maintains his private practice in St. Louis, Missouri. He's an assistant clinical professor at the St. Louis University for Advanced Dental Education, where his lectures and clinical oversight focus on the Invisalign appliance system. He was featured as a lead educator for Align's Beep Bite Solutions and Class 2 Kit. He's a diplomat of the American Board of Orthodontics and a fellow of the International American College of Dentists and the Pierre Fichard Academy. He has spent his life in service and study in the field of professional orthodontics. When it comes to clear aligners and vis lines, there's nothing he can't do or teach. After graduating from MICDS in 1998, he enrolled in Emory University, where he received his BS in neurobehavior biology. He then moved on to the University of Louisville to obtain his doctorate, master's in neurobiology, and certified of advanced training in orthodontics. In no time, he attained diplomat status with the American Board of Orthodontics and became a fellow of the American College of Dentists, the International College of Dentists, and the Pierre Fichard. Um, currently, he is clinical assistant professor in the orthodontic residency program at the Center for Advanced Dental Education at St. Louis University. He manages the Clear Aligner curriculum and provides lectures on Invisalign. He's also a featured lecturer and Ask the Expert speaker for Align Technology, the makers of Invisalign, traveling internationally to educate orthodontists on the proper use of the uh, um, appliance. He is co-founder of the Aligner Intensive Fellowship, an online residency that has educated thousands of doctors worldwide on the proper treatment planning and the use of a liner. I swear, what is it about St. Louis? That's like the mafioso headquarters of ortho. You got you got the orthodontic, um, the American Association of Orthodontics there, the International Association of Orthodontics there. Um, is it that arch? Is is that an arch wire? Is that what it is? <laughs> That's actually part of our logo. It's funny you said that. We made our logo the art, the St. Louis arch, but then it's like a shadow is another arch wire, you know, in terms of the two arches. So yeah, that's very, that's very astute and intuitive of you. Yeah. It, it has to be an arch wire. I mean, that yeah. is ground zero for orthodontics around the world, isn't it? It's a significant history here. Uh, I can throw a rock at the AAO, you know, building uh, Edward Engel was here at St. Louis University. We have a lot of great, great orthodontists that came through St. Louis University. So it's steeped in history, for sure. Yeah, and uh, what do you think? Um, um, and, and you know what's interesting is <clears throat> the first president of the American Dental Association was an MD and a DDS. The current president of the uh, American Dental Association is an oral surgeon right here from Tucson, and he's an MD and a DDS. Edward H. Engel um, I just want to believe that the H stands for Howard. Uh, if it doesn't, uh, just don't don't tell me. I've lived under this. Uh, do you know what it stood for? I, I actually don't, but I think Howard's a pretty darn yeah, good Yeah, just start telling everybody Howard. And, well, and then tell him that he was named <laughs> and after me uh, 100 years <laughs> before dying. But yeah, Edward H. Engel, he was an MD and a DDS. He's the father of American orthodontics. Um, do you ever wonder, um, he lived 1855 to 1930, what do you think Edward would think about um, today? Well, if you brought uh, you know, him back to life, you know, he, he obviously everything was rooted in uh, biology, especially I think being a, an MD in terms of what he was thinking through and how he was uh, really, I think, inventing the profession of orthodontics at the time. Uh, but looking now, the way everything's gone digital and how we're able to customize our appliances uh, to the patient versus having to actually bend everything by hand or band everything by hand. Uh, I think you'd be just amazed at how pervasive orthodontics is, how much of it's expanded. Because I think back when he was doing it, obviously not many people were going through it. So I think his uh, his mind would be blown to, to, to keep it short and simple. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm having a hard day today because I just found out that the H was for Hartley. It wasn't oh. a Howard. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Um, but it does goes to show you that um, the world is just changing so fast. I mean, if you if you don't like what's happening in the world, all you got to do is wait a year or five years or ten years. It's just upward and onward. I mean, every I am always telling my boys when they're 
bummed out about, you know, what's happening and uh, whatever. And I just say, well, man, you flip back every hundred years. It just gets better and better. And, yeah, it's two steps forward, one step time. But, like, this pandemic, it didn't bother me really at all because – I'd rather I'd rather have humans attacked by another species, a virus, than when they start killing each other. Everybody's talking about COVID's killed three million people. It's like a uh, reminder: World War II was seventy million. I'll take three million deaths from another species any day than when humans turn on each other and start going to town on each other. That, that that's the uh, the the worst thing uh, ever. So uh, uh, so I got to ask you. Um, have you been vaccinated? I have been vaccinated. Uh, actually, this is uh, the day after I guess, the CDC announced that uh, fully vaccinated people can basically no longer need to socially distance or wear masks in public, which was just like the biggest blessing for me because I'm ready to get back to the way things were, quite honestly. Um, you know, we've, we've been through a lot, obviously. Uh, and like you said, you know, relative to what it actually was versus what it could have been, you know, the past year, yeah, were there challenges? You know, we did we have to think on our feet? We did. But I think most dentists are very blessed. I think most dentists are uh, doing pretty well now coming out of the pandemic. And, you know, we, we're definitely moving on. So, no, I'm definitely vaccinated as my whole family. Thank God. My dad, I think I told you, Howard, before we started, he's 70 years old and he still works. So I think that was a huge uh, relief for him. I could literally hear the inflection of his voice change the day that he got his vaccine because I didn't realize how much stress and weight he had been carrying because uh, obviously it's a scary situation, but uh, you know, we're, we're getting on the other side of it. So we're, we're very fortunate. Yeah. Um, does it concern you? Um, yesterday we heard that uh, my favorite Friday night show is Bill Maher on dentistry uncensored Saturday night. It's Saturday night live, but um, he canceled tonight because despite being fully vaccinated, um, he came down with COVID. And then um, Kyle was telling me this morning that the on the New York Yankees, uh, that they had the Johnson Johnson vaccine, and now like a dozen of them are sick. Um, does that mean um, I had the uh, BioNTech Pfizer? But um, do you know, do, do you think there's something going on? Do you think there's a new variant? Is it, um, are, are we not out of the woods yet? I don't think it concerns me. I think from what I've understood and read about it, um, it, you know, when people get the vaccine, it's not 100% effective. And if you get COVID, you're not usually not going to the hospital. And by usually, I mean, my understanding is that you don't go to the hospital. The morbidity decreases significantly. I get a flu shot every year, but have I gotten the flu shot on the flu? The answer is yes. Uh, but did the flu kill me? Obviously not. Um, so I think at some point, you know, we have to kind of look at it globally and understand what the vaccine is really doing for us. It's keeping us out of the hospital. It's not going to necessarily prevent anyone from getting COVID. And we're probably going to have to keep on getting the vaccine moving forward through our lives. So, uh, you know, I'm not too surprised that hearing people are getting COVID, even though they've been vaccinated necessarily. So uh, as long as they're not dying or any other hospital, I think that's the win. So your dad turned 70 when to yesterday or when? Yep. When? May 13th yesterday. Oh my God. And he's 70 years old. 70 years old, yeah. Well, tell him a uh, happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday for me. That is just amazing. Um, um, my gosh, I don't want to get too uh, deep and personal on you, but um, um, working with the family, I mean, um, I had two older sisters, and they left high school and went straight to the Catholic nunnery, and then I had three younger sisters who got married and had babies. But um, when I was 10, Dad went from delivering rainbow bread for like 11 grand a year to he saved up his money. Even though he only made 11 grand a year and had seven kids and a stay-home spouse, he was still able to save up those 10 years, bought a Sonic drive-in franchise, wow. and um, my gosh, the rest was history. I mean, just but when we would work for him... He was, he was a hard guy. He was a tough dude. And he was my idol. I loved it. But my God, my five sisters did not like it. Like if he, if he, you know, was too hard on at work or said, I told you to do blah, blah, blah. They would carry that baggage home. And then that night they, you know, they'd be mad at him or didn't want to talk to him or whatever. And, and dad would look at me like, is she mad because I made her redo the onion rings or, you know, what the hell's going on? But um, I know it, it's different for every dad and mom and brother and sister, but what's it like working in a family? You're in there with your dad and your sister. Um, have you ever had to call 911 to break up a fight? 
And I'm not going to say it's always, you know, uh, it smells like roses in here. Obviously, we have our disagreements and you tend to speak uh, on a different level with your family than you would your your uh, your colleagues or peers if they weren't in your family. Uh, but I think that honesty also helps in, a, in, a, in another way because we don't really hold anything back. Uh, we're, we're truly deeply honest with each other when we communicate. Uh, and with, you know, I have two kids of my own. I have a, a son and a daughter. And when I look at them, my son's seven, my daughter's four, but they're starkly, completely two different people. Uh, and so, you know, melding those personalities, you can't necessarily choose who your siblings are when you bring them into the office with you. I think that communication up front in terms of what expectations are, are really important. Uh, because, for example, myself, I'm very type A. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm always go, go, go. You know, I wake up and I sleep doing what I do. My sister, when it's five o'clock, she's off the clock. She wants life balance uh, and she's younger than me. So I'm not sure if that's a generational difference or if that's just who she is. Uh, but, you know, for me, I was like, when you get off work, you got to, you know, take your referring dentist out or you got to go to your study club meetings or you got to read some journals. You got to do this, that and the other, continue to sharpen the sword. Um, but that's not what she wants to do. And I, you know, I had to learn that that was OK. And it took me a while to change who I was to accept that. Uh, so especially being the older sibling, you kind of feel like you're established sometimes and you did so much to build a practice for your younger sibling to join. You almost want them to do the exact same you thing you did and more because you feel like they almost may owe you something, but that's not really appropriate. And I've had to learn to kind of swallow my pride and to understand that her view on things is not necessarily wrong. If anything, it may be, it may be more right. Um, and, you know, with dad, I think uh, it's just a blessing to join and have a mentor behind you. You know, when you get out of dental school or even residency, you're, I think you know enough to be dangerous. There's certainly... Uh, continual learning path that the continue, it's always happening, you know, year over year I'm learning. And that's, uh, it's just amazing to me that, you know, you feel like you get peaked out or maybe plateau and then all of a sudden you go through a whole new learning curve. Um, but having that behind me, it was a blessing, but do we still, my father, you know, he started this baby from scratch, you know, almost 40 years ago. So he obviously has his opinions on things and he wants to be involved in the, in the process. So we definitely, still have that balance and that chemistry between us that we always have to make sure it doesn't boil over uh, with what we're putting in the pot. But all in all, the, the lid has stayed on to this point. So we're, we're very fortunate. And how often do you have to uh, call mom uh, to break up the fight between uh, you, dad, and your sister? We don't call mom because she's an endodontist. So we, uh, your we mom is an endodontist? <laughs> yeah. Is she really? She is. Holy moly, have you done 23 and Me to find out if there's a uh, a gene? Uh, do you think your uh, two kids got the gene? Oh, man. I, it's interesting. My, my son is seven. Uh, my, my wife had told me this the other day. I never even asked her about it. But she said, you know, my son's name is Shia. She says, Shia, what do you want to do when you grow up? Do you want to be a builder? Because he's all into the trucks and construction and stuff. He's like, no, I, I want to, I want to join the family business. And so he said he wanted to get into dentistry all on his own. So, you know, I think there is a little bit of a bug there. So we'll see. Time will tell. Wow. Well, he must, um, he must, um, I mean, he loves you and respects you and he must love his sister and his grandma and his grandpa. It just must be a lot of love there. And, right. um, but every, everything's a trade off. Um, that's all the good stuff. What do you think is the most challenging part? And, and l- l- let me ask you this, cause, um, how long you've been working with your dad? I've been practicing my father for 13 years. Okay, so I uh, so let's take that decade plus experience and channel it right to a yearly problem. Um, this is May, and uh, this month, uh, 6,500 dental kids are going to graduate. And um, you know, business has always been family business. I mean, if you were born in uh, Ethiopia and your father was a goat farmer, um, that's your ticket in. I mean, why wouldn't you follow it? Um, a lot of names mean, uh, like um, uh, Smith came from blacksmith. Um, um, Faran is uh, Arabic, uh, Lebanese, uh, means baker. Uh, you know, names mean something. So a lot of them, you know, the only reason she went to dental school is because her mom's a dentist. She loves her mom. She wants to go back there. And um, maybe she gets in there and her mom's really big into placing implants, but she's seeing all oh, the five millimeters of periodontal disease and wondering if they should get, you know, some type of uh, um, laser or something or um 
in my day, it used to be, they go back with their dad, your mom's an endodontist, and dad was flipping Sargeni Endo. And he uh, says, I don't care what those idiots at school, I've been using this forever, and Sargeni's the best. I bet you haven't even heard the word Sargeni in a decade, have you? When's the last time you even heard Sargeni Endo? I mean, I, 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 it's ghastly. I've never even heard of it. <laughs> you, you ever heard of Sargeni Endo? Oh, my God. You're either real young or I'm real old. But Dr. Angelo Sargeni in Europe, he, he, the first time, he came out with a paraformaldehyde paste. Yeah. And so you just open up and you spin that paraformaldehyde paste down there and it kill all the germs. Of course, it could come out the apex and, and uh, none of the uh, epidemiologists or doctors like Russia has a spin on that where they would take, um, instead of paraformaldehyde, they used... Um, Oh my gosh! What's that most toxic? Uh, not cyanide. Um, uh, the Russian, uh, Russian endo paste. Was it cyanide? Uh, Russian. I hope uh, not. Endo paste uh, ingredient. Um, it was a uh, formaldehyde, but they also added another ingredient. Um, what the hell was that ingredient? But anyway, I think it was. Um, um, yeah, but anyway, they they had their uh, Russian. Um, um, Endodontist. But anyway, they, they would come back and the endodontist at school just talked about how bad it was. They brought in malpractice, uh, dental disability insurance people, and they said you will lose every single time you're caught using this uh, paraformaldehyde paste. Um, but anyway, they, they just come back and, you know, they have a, a big problem with something their mom or dad is doing as a dentist. Sure. But it's their mom. It's their dad. It's the love of their life. What advice would you give? Um, and some of them are traumatized by it. And, and then, and then I'll lead into the other part of it. Is um, they go in. She graduates. She works with her mom. Her mom's doing seven hundred and fifty a year. Uh, five years later, six years later, ten years later, it's built up to like one and a half million dollars. And they, you know, just like you probably don't have a prenuptial agreement with your wife in marriage. Do you have a prenup? I, no, I do not have a prenup. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. And and so she doesn't have a prenup with her husband. She doesn't have a prenup with her mom, the dentist. And then her mom goes out and gets an appraisal and says, my office does $1.5 million a year. I'll sell it to you. And she's like, mom, I, 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 I built half that. You're going to charge me for the half I built? So that whole Pandora's box to everything I just said, from clinical dentistry to money, what advice would you give these young babies coming out of dental school that got to go back uh, and, and work with mom and dad and haven't thought all these things out? So two th I heard two questions there. So I'll address the first one in terms of uh, kind of coming out with wanting to change things. I think it's really important to not be like a bull in a china shop because when you come out of school, you're going to have a lot of energy. You're going to have a lot of ideas and you're going to want to make it your own. You're going to want to add your spin to things. But at the end of the day, uh, the practice is, is built, and it's, a, it's probably a solid practice, hopefully, if you're joining, but you can't stir the pot too much because it can actually have the negative effect of what you're hoping for to happen, I think, in the long run, by creating a lot of stress. And also, not just between you and your, your family, but also with the team and the employees, because they can only take so much change at a time. So my really advice, I think, is to you know, have a list of what you want to handle or what you want to change, but really address one or two items a year and let the dust settle from those and kind of prove your performance. Like if you have suggestions and your, your family is seeing, or let's say your mom or dad, whoever it is, is seeing that what you're doing is working, then that, that's going to lend them to give you more trust essentially and start integrating more and more over time. Uh, and I think, you know, my hope would be that anyone would be reasonable to, or to be amenable to change. But if you're trying to do everything at once, that's really, I think, a recipe for failure. So uh, I think prioritize your your, your wants uh, in terms of what you wish to do and then handle one thing at a time and make sure that you communicate properly and you know make sure that you do it as a team. Um, and I, I know I was guilty of that. I had all these ideas when I joined my father of things I wanted to do. And uh, I, I just learned to be a little more brakes than gas uh, because I didn't want to tax our relationship. And also, uh, more importantly, I didn't want to stress the employees out. I could see that the employees were kind of like, oh, my God, this guy's coming in and he wants to grow the practice. I'm going to be working so much harder and I'm going to be so much busier. You know, so you have to kind of balance those things out. The other aspect of what you're referring to uh, about the, the, the practice acquisition, I think it's important that you really, I think, establish that up front, meaning that uh, you 
before you graduate dental school, if you're really looking to buy into the practice, if that's your agreement, that you have that contract up front. And, and I think that's uncomfortable. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're going to be much happier because things are going to be defined. There's going to be no guesswork. So if you're going to buy the practice of the evaluation when you joined it and you're going to sit there and put some sweat equity into it uh, at some point in time, you know, is that sweat equity going to be split? You know, you, you shouldn't have to sell like a whole increase in evaluation because of the work you put into it. So, you know, there's there's people much more adept at that language than obviously what I can tell you. But um, I truly believe that if you establish that up front, that that's going to be much less stress in the long run. So. Those are the pieces of advice I would I would give. Um, by the way, the the Russian red endodontic therapy, Angelo Sergeni was just a pair from out of the height base, but the Russians added arsenic to it. Arsenic. And it, it was amazing because um when you see these teeth, um, like you know, every ethnic group comes to America and wherever the first one lands, that's for the family. Like you go to Pol- uh, um Chicago. One in every eight people in Poland, I mean in Chicago, are from Poland. When I lectured the first time in Poland after the Berlin Wall fell, um, every single Polish dentist I ever met asked me if I knew his cousin uh, in uh, in Chicago. I mean, they all have family in Chicago. And the Russians have a huge community in Southern Cal. They have one in uh, um, the, the Red Teapot area in um, um, Manhattan. Uh, but yeah, they would add arsenic. And when I was in Russia, um, I talked to dentists who um, remember those days. And the older guys said, now remember, just put a little pinch. Doesn't take very much. And then they'd say, well, what happens if you put too much? And it says, well, they'll start foaming at the mouth and they'll die. And I thought, (laughs) wow. But they work. And then when you see them, when you see these old people, and I've treated them, um, the tooth is from the arsenic is just completely jet black. And if you try to take out the paste, it's just solid, hard rock. Uh, But but when people look at that and say, that's uh, so terrible, well, well, you can't say that. That that I mean, where does that come from? They think Angelo Sartini's technique saved over a billion teeth. Now, did ex someone die from something else that shouldn't have? I'm sure yes. The Russian ended on it. I know for a fact others died, but um, billions of teeth were saved with these techniques. So, uh, but yeah, ask your mom about that. That is uh, that is just crazy stuff. Um, this is dentistry uncensored, so I don't want to uh, talk about anything anybody all agrees with and everything. But there is a profound sense of dental students that when they're in dental school, um, the oral surgeons will teach them anything and everything they know to try to extract a tooth, the endodontist for endo, the pediatric dentist for pedo. And then they get to ortho, and it's like craniofacial growth and development. Um, you know, here's how... The jaw looks from embryo. And it's like, dude, dude, we're talking about Invisalign. We're talking about clear aligners. Right. And it is, and it is, it is believed by many that the the business acumen of orthodontists have kept that knowledge out of the schools. And then I got two other data points on that. Um, I'm only aware of two board certified orthodontists in the United States that directly um, focus on teaching ortho to GPs. One was uh, Force, uh, Rich, um, um, uh, well, one's in my backyard, and um, and the other one was Force. What was that, uh, Rick? Um, R- Richard Litt, who was the uh, ortho chairman at University of uh, UOP, no, uh, UFCS, University of California, San Francisco, for a decade. Then he was at Detroit teaching their ortho practice uh, for a decade. Um, do you agree with that? Is this the um, is this the one of the 12 dental specialties that the dental specialist orthodontists really don't want you to know all about? So I would tell you, I think I agree that the education is light in, in dental school, 100% for um, the dental students that you don't get taught much orthodontics, but orthodontics in and of itself is extremely nuanced. So I think it's hard to really pick up what you would want to learn in a dental school environment and uh, orthodontics itself. And I'm just telling you this from even working with my sister. Uh, it's an extremely humbling profession because you think you actually know what you're doing. And then you start getting in the mouth and you start seeing things going the opposite way of what you thought you were doing. And it takes learning those mistakes. It takes, uh, and I tell even my residents when I teach at SLU, that you're really not going to feel comfortable in your own skin being an orthodontist and being confronted with a situation where you're kind of wondering what to do until about five years out of practice. 
uh, because even with there's biomechanics, there's biology involved, growth and development, there's a lot that goes into it. So I don't think it's necessarily that the professors are trying to hold back any secrets, but it's not something that can be also taught, I think, in dental school. So if people want to really learn about it, if they have the volition or the want to further that, they can either obviously go to residency or they can continue to go to courses when they graduate school. But um, there's a lot, there's a lot to it, honestly. Uh, you know, we treat people for a year to two years. So I think a lot of the procedures in terms of endo, root canals, extractions, those can be done in a couple of visits. Uh, and there's some immediate gratification there, but it's not the same with orthodontics. And I think because of the longevity of what's involved, I think that's much harder to teach uh, in a succinct manner and that it does take a continuous education over time. Well, that is very interesting and true about the, where an orthodontic case is two years. So yeah. um, treating a two-year case uh, in dental school, that's very different than doing something on a two appointment like a root canal or a crown or something like that. So, um, so do you think that's a big part of it then? Just the fact that the, uh, the treatment time uh, is so much longer that it makes it harder to teach? I do because you learn along every step of the way. You know, you learn, you make mistakes, I should say, even along every step of the way. So, for example, you mentioned Invisalign. Invisalign is extremely nuanced, uh, meaning that, you know, that, that, that animation, if you will, in terms of what's shown as a projection, as a prediction of what's going to happen clinically. But really, that's a representation of a force system. It's not a representation of a result. And so you put that force system in the patient's mouth. And there's all these other variables, such as growth and development, if it's a teenager, such as uh, equal and opposite reactions to forces. So if a patient presents with generalized spacing and you're closing that spacing with the aligner, the bite's going to deepen because that's what happens when you close spaces orthodontically. But the clin check doesn't show that. So now all of a sudden you end up clinically with a bite that's deeper than what was predicted on the clin check. Well, now you have a posterior open bite because the patient's only biting on their front teeth. But that's not really something that you would anticipate happening without some level of either having made that mistake before or if it was formally taught to you in another manner. But those type of variables can add up very quickly. Uh, and that's just, again, one example. So all those things, I think, make it very challenging to truly give that education because those mistakes can be made along the way. But, you know, how would you ever know to get there unless you went through that refinement phase? And then how do you get out of that issue? So, it's, it's complex, I should say. It's, it's really multifactorial. And I think given the treatment time and period and all the different, you have class two, class three, class one extractions or the surgery, uh, you know, growth and development, functional appliances, expansion needs, there's a lot that goes on with orthodontics that make it, I think, tough to really uh, give a proper education that's not more focused or limited in a dental school environment. Interesting, interesting. Um, that, that's a... Um... Great way to say it. Um, I always think extremist views are a red flag if something's wrong. Like, um, like when when a dentist tells me that um they don't have amalgam in their office, I always think to myself, really, you got two thousand patients and there's not one. One, I mean, all these cavities fail by biology; they have recurrent decay. And um, my gosh, um, you have an Alzheimer's patient that doesn't even recognize her children. She has no, um, she has no awareness, but you use a inert plastic composite on her class fives. When if you would have used a less aesthetic glass ionomer, um, it would have last longer. But when you use amalgams, they actually last four years. And they're like, well, I, you know, I'm a cosmetic dentist. I'm not going to put them out. It's like, she doesn't even know who her children is. It's right. not about cosmetics. And, and then I've asked every boy that's ever come in, I said, okay, I'm going to do this filling on the top of your tooth. If I do an amalgam, it's going to last 38 years. If I do a plastic composite, it's going to last six and a half. Uh, do you want, do you want to do this one time and not have to do it again until you're 40 years old? But, um, I, I see people in advertising that they have an Invisalign only practice. They have no straight wires, no brackets, no anything. And I'm thinking eight billion homo sapiens walking around this jungle and not one of them needed brackets and a bonding. Really? I mean, I, I just, I don't believe it. I mean, I don't, what, I don't believe it either. Uh, I think that, you know, certain cases that you need braces. Uh, that's just the bottom line. Uh, there's, there's cases that if someone like mutilated dentition, multiple missing teeth, where, 
you're trying to redistribute space uh, by closing it, let's say even, uh, you know, getting bodily movement of teeth within a liner can be extremely challenging. So um, I don't think that if someone really is doing that, they, it's going to be very hard to actually do it to a large scale. If you have a very boutique practice, we're able to integrate a lot of TADs and um, things of that nature to help get those forces where you need them to make up for the inadequacy of the aligner. Maybe I could see it happening, but uh, I, I really have problems seeing that. I think majority of practices, they, they may have a 70%, 80% share of chair of aligners in their office, but they still have that 20% of braces because there's always, I think, going to be a need for that. So, and I, again, there goes the extremist word, I guess, always and never, but I think braces will always have a place uh, personally. I think there, there's always going to be a situation where you would still use them. So I, to me, uh, when Invisalign or clear liners comes out, I mean, uh, to me, it's just obvious that girls spend a lot more time in the morning getting ready to go to school. I remember uh, if any of my, my, my children's sisters, one of them was a track star and could beat the crap out of me though I was in the eighth grade. And I always try to remind her this and, uh, when she's uh, in front of other nuns. Uh, and, um, and, uh, you know, um, but it, but she would, I, I could bring her to her knees in one second. All I would do is I would get up before she did on a school day and I'd hide her steamroller curlers things and her tackle box and makeup and all this. And my God, you could get, you could get any confession, any, any, any promise out of them, you know, to make you cookies and cakes and candies. Um, but when Invisalign came out, I thought to myself, Man, God, if it was a boy, you know, you know that you have those boys that come in your office. They always wear the same shirt, their hair sticking up, and you're like, I would rather take control and glue everything, wire these braces in his mouth because I just don't think he's gonna, um, he's gonna, um, you know, get all involved. Do you see any of that, or is that, or is that my perception just not uh, clinical reality? No, you're 100 percent spot on. I mean, you have to a lot of our role is like a, a psychologist, psychiatrist, like when we're in the chair with the patient and the counselor, I'm looking at the kid, I'm looking at the mom, uh, who's usually 99% of the mom that's in the consult with the kid. And I'm just seeing, you know, are they, are they well kept? Are they asking questions about Invisalign? Do they want to even be here? Right. Because if they're kind of sitting there with poor body language in the chair, and say, you know, Johnny, what concerns you? Why are you here? And they say, well, if they come out straight up and say, this tooth really bothers me, I would like to treat it with Invisalign, then that's a really positive thing because the kid is taking ownership of the situation. But if they're saying, well, my mom brought me in and uh, I don't really know why I'm here. And the mom is saying, well, you know, it just, everyone else in seventh grade has them. So I feel like I should bring them in for a consultation. You know, that's a little bit uh, of the wrong foot to start off on. But, you know, you don't want to automatically also, I think, paint the child into a corner that they're all going to be non-compliant because there's so much compliance involved with braces. You can get real harm with braces. Even if the child is not doing their job in terms of brushing and breaking their brackets all the time, not wearing their rubber bands. So it's kind of, it's kind of a catch 22, but I wouldn't say we offer Invisalign to every single patient that walks in the door. It's really after we have a solid conversation with them and assess their chief complaint and what their desires and wants are. And then also just being very frank and honest about, the uh, positives and negatives of both appliances, because there's definitely, there's no perfect appliance in orthodontics. So when we talk about braces, we say, you know, there's going to be more frequent visits to see us. You have to limit your diet more. Brushing is going to be more of a challenge. We actually recommend they see their dentist every four months when they're in braces to get their cleanings, to make sure that the hygiene stays on point. And then with the liners, we say less dietary restrictions, better hygiene, but significantly more compliance. You have to really be very uh, committed to the process. Uh, and so, you know, we, you kind of weigh those two things with them, see how their, their conversation goes and then make a decision kind of as a, as a team, you know, I want it to be a team decision. I don't want to ever dictate what appliances the patient needs, unless I really, really feel that I cannot do my job unless I use one certain appliance. Like for example, an open bite case, if I have a patient coming in with an open bite, I'd much rather treat them with the liners all day long, you know, so, and I'll go through the benefits of that. Or if I have a severe deep bite case, many times I'd rather treat that case with braces, so those are instances where I may really try to dictate one appliance over another. But if they're somewhere in the middle, then that really becomes kind of a, a joint decision between us. Wow, interesting. Um, so you're um, you're also talk, talk about the St. Louis University Center for Advanced Dental Education. Um, as goes known by Cade. Um, tell us about Cade. There's a lot of people who might not even be aware of this. 
It's uh, in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, talk, talk about Cade. So Cade, uh, basically, St. Louis, back in the day, just like Washington University, used to have a dental school. Uh, but unfortunately, those dental schools have closed down. But at St. Louis University, fortunately, the residencies remained. So uh, at St. Louis University, there was an orthodontic residency. There's a, a periodontal, a period residency, an endo residency, and recently they opened up a pedo residency. I think about five years ago, if I'm not mistaken. And so uh, at, the, at K, the Center for Advanced Dental Education, the orthodontic program is one of the largest in the country and really one of the most state of the art. It's a beautiful facility and significant history uh, in that program. And so I'm, I'm very proud to be uh, affiliated with. It, honestly, uh, the residents are amazing and. Uh, it's a great it's a great place to be. It's a two and a half year program uh, for the ortho residency there. And it's about 15 residents a class that come through. Um, that's an interesting question. You just opened up, um, you know, 200 years of retail shows us that bigger um, was better. Uh, you go back 300 years in New York, um, you would have a little family business about the 10 foot by 10 foot. And you live upstairs. They call it a shop house. Uh, they still do it in many uh, continents today. And then the next generation say, you know what? I, I know I'm going to be dead, mom. I'm, I'm going to have one twice as big. And then it went to tw two stalls and three stalls. And it got all the way up to 250,000 square foot Walmarts and Costco's and, and uh, all these uh, Lowe's and price clubs before Walmart stepped in and said, okay, we, we got too big. Now it's it's downward pressures in our sales for square foot. Like like me, I, I'd rather buy, I'd rather get a gallon of milk at 7-Eleven than go to Walmart and walk 100,000 yards, you know, to the front door. Um, I, I like to quick stuff. Um, but um, we saw with Clear Choice that when they took the surgeon that placed the implant with the prosthodontist that restored it and the lab tech, one plus one plus one, uh, was equaled five. It was bought and sold five times. Uh, the last person that bought it was Bob Fontana at Aspen because uh, he can funnel literally 800 patients talk asking about all on fours into these clear choice centers. But yep. pediatric dentistry and ortho is doing the same thing. I mean, if you take 100 kids to a pediatric dentist, you're saying 90% of children's consults are with the mom, not the dad. Is that what you're sa you said? Yeah, I would say that's pretty accurate. Yeah, so I always like to remind people that when they say there's no difference between boys and girls, it's like, I'm pretty sure there are. And when I got in my MBA degree, women spend two out of three discretionary income dollars. Uh, and when 100 moms take 100 kids to the pediatric dentist, every one of them's going to ask, hey, is little Billy, will he need braces someday? So to put that retail under one deal, I've seen in my own backyard that if a pediatric dentist opens with an orthodontist, one plus one equals three because a brand new ped and a brand new ortho at the end of the year is two, but you combine them, it's three. Is that kind of the future of orthodontics and pediatric dentistry that um, it's going to be um, one plus one equals three for the pediatric market? I mean, I don't know what percent of your practice is adult only ortho. Um, what percent is um, would see a pediatric dentist? I guess anyone under eighteen. Um, talk talk about that. Where, where do you see that going? Yeah, I think I think that's obviously a match made in heaven uh, in terms of a, a ortho and a pedo. We personally we have like a forty percent adult practice. We we treat a lot of TMD and uh, do a significant amount of orthodontic surgery, uh, I think, as an average uh, in St. Louis. So we just have a little bit of a different model. Uh, obviously, if you were to walk through the office on a, on a clinical day, there's a ton of kids in here as well. But uh, most practices, I think, being able to buddy up with a pediatric dentist is very important. St. Louis, I think, has a dearth, actually, of pediatric dentists. There's a significant number more of orthodontists here. So I'm not sure about the model in St. Louis per se. Uh, I feel like we outnumber our pedos almost like five to one uh, in, in the St. Louis market, but other markets where maybe it's more des desirable to live, I feel like you have a lot more pediatric dentists and I see a lot more of those relationships when I talk to my colleagues and my peers where there's uh, ortho and pedo in the same office. And it just makes sense, obviously, because the referral is just built in it's, it's right there and orthodontics almost for kids now is almost a, a rite of passage. So you know that it's going to, like you said, one to one equals three or four or five in terms of what's going to happen symbiotically there uh, for the practice. But um, yeah, in St. Louis, I think that's one of the nice things about the pedo program that opened up here recently is that hopefully whenever you have residencies, 
in any city, inevitably some of them end up staying. Uh, so hopefully I should balance out here over time. Um, wow. So you're, um, you're saying there's a lot more uh, ortho orthodontics is more saturated than pediatric dentist. I think because Wash U had an ortho program here, uh, and I believe at the time it did not have a pedo program, and then SLU for the longest time, Stanford University having its ortho program that again graduates 15 a year, that inevitably, uh, you know, in St. Louis, there's a lot more orthodontists than pediatric dentists, a lot more. Huh. So, so you do you think that is going to be a match made in heaven, and you would advise that young orthodontists go find a pediatric dentist? And, uh, and merge? I, th I think so, if they're able to do so, and it makes um, the business relationship make sense. Obviously, the referrals would make sense. You know, for us as orthodontic, like for example, this Monday, um, we're doing deliveries to 50 dental offices. Uh, you know, so obviously, we're, we're a referral-based business, and that's a big part of uh, trying to see new patients and having the phone ring is making sure that you keep the relationships with your referring practices. Uh, but because we don't have a lot of pediatric dentists here, I'm uh, obviously approaching a lot of general dentists still to get referrals. And we do a lot of pre-prosthetic orthodontics or pre-restorative orthodontics. And that's why we see so many adult patients uh, because of that. But yeah, if we, if an orthodontist is able to be, for example, I know some orthodontists are in the middle of a pediatric dental office. They don't talk to any referrals. They don't do any marketing or deliveries because everything is built in for them. So it's just a different model. Uh, you know, what we did for our practice, I, I ran a sphere study group for many years. I ran a, my own personal study group for many years before that, trying to get on the same page with all my referring dentists because there weren't many pediatric dentists here. It's hard for an orthodontist to go to a study club with pediatric dentists because truly, other than educating them on referral patterns, what are you really learning? Whereas if you're with a general dentist and you're talking about setting cases up for uh, pre-restorative work, there's, that's a whole different learning path. So it's kind of what you're interested, I think, in, in, in terms of really what your passion is and how, how busy you want to be and what type of busy. Do you want to be busy in your practice all the time or do you want to still be busy learning about orthodontics, learning about other aspects of dentistry? I think those are two distinctly different roads that you can walk down if you do or do not partner with a pediatric dentist as an orthodontist. Now, is there any... Um... What DSO comes to mind when you think of adding pediatric dentist plus orthodontist? Is any any DSO trying to really do that? You know, I don't know of one off the top of my mind. We recently, our practice, we are part of Orthodontic Partners, which is an orthodontics only uh, orthodontic service organization. And they're not really interested in the pediatric dentistry model. Uh, for what reason specifically, I honestly don't know. Uh, but I know that there's probably some DSOs that would leverage that or see that as being beneficial uh, to do that. So that's, you know, I don't know of any of my mind that to be honest with you. And again, probably because I'm in St. Louis. So in St. Louis, I don't know of any pediatric and ortho combination uh, DSOs that exist. So how is the orthodontic partners uh, doing? Uh, how long have you been a, um, a part of that? So I joined orthodontic partners uh, in December 31st of 2020. So it's been about five months. Uh, that we've been with them. And Orthodontic Partners is really brand new. Um, so it's it's ground level in terms of what we're doing. Uh, the founding doctors are Jeff Kozlowski out of uh, Michigan, or Jeff Kos he's in Connecticut, and Jamie Reynolds out of Michigan. And uh, two guys I really look up to and admire. Uh, David Sarver also joined the group, and David Sarver is one of my mentors. So uh, the, the culmination of those gentlemen uh, and kind of what their mission was in terms of how they wanted to grow this entity uh, really attracted me to it. We were in conversation for all of 2020, which was a really obviously interesting time to be in discussions <laughs> to join. Uh, but we ended up closing on the New Year's. So, Yeah, and Jamie, he was also the co-founder of OrthoFi. Yes, yeah, so that's another reason why I, I wanted to join them is that he already had experience in um, selling a business to private equity and going through the process of growing a business that eventually went to private equity. So given that experience uh, that he had, uh, he brought a lot to the table in terms of just being able to kind of mentor us through uh, this transition as we, as we grow. And is that um, DSOs is kind of funny. It took a pandemic 
to flip their image around. I mean, um, when I got to school in 87, there was always a bad guy. It was uh, HMOs. It was capitation. It was it, it was always something. And then DSOs. Um, um, actually, they started with, with you guys. They, the whole yeah. DSO on NASDAQ started with Orthodontic Centers of America, Gaspar yeah. Lazarus. And he made it to NASDAQ along with – and he was the leader – and the first one to get a billion dollar valuation, and there was a dozen of them, and then they all just internally collapsed, and they were gone, and now they're back. I noticed not one of them um, has made it back to Wall Street. Um, Wall Street hasn't entertained the thought of any of them for a liquidity uh, event. I don't know um, if that's going to change. Um, I've been hearing um, uh, it, it, it did not escape my attention when I saw that. Um, which one was it? Um, Oh gosh, uh, uh, who was the one that just uh, did an IPO on the uh, Canadian stock uh, market? Um, I'm not familiar with it. Oh gosh, what is what was that one called? I'll tell you real quick. But anyway, it wasn't Nasdaq, it wasn't Wall Street, it was um, some you know Canadian um, stock market exchange, and I'm not discounting that. I mean that's that's a real thing, it's a real event. But again, it's not Nasdaq if they were. If they were um, bigger, um, again, it just it just wasn't what we're used to. Who was that? Um, oh, Dental Corp, uh, Dental Corp Holdings, which uh, dental there's Dental Corp uh, Canada, Dental Corp Australia, Dental Corp uh, New Zealand. Now there's a new Dental Corp uh, uh, starting uh, in USA, Dental Corp USA, but Dental Corp Holdings. Uh, to raise nine hundred and fifty million dollars. That's short of Gasper's. That's almost Gasper's one billion in the TSX IPO and placement uh, coming up, and that was in the uh, Private Capital uh, Journal. Uh, but um, in- interesting, uh, interesting times there. But I'm sure the St. Louis Orthodontic Mafia. Uh, there was more people uh, not happy with that event. Uh, then there were happy with a uh, orthodon DSO. You 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 couldn't convince me other, uh, but 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 that pandemic again it flipped the mindset because it was during the pandemic that this bad guy that there was safety in numbers. I remember talking to uh, Rick Workman at Heartland Dental and he couldn't even answer the phone of all the dentists that wanted to sell their practice. And they realized during a pandemic that there's uh, there's a reason those mustocks form a circle when they see an enemy and put the babies in the middle and and uh we were attacked by a virus and um my gosh it was crazy times and there were just a lot of dentists who said you know what i i just can't do this i can't wear all the hats because when you have to wear all the hats you might be fine with saying okay so i'm not gonna do marketing i'm not gonna do advertising i'm not gonna do i'm not gonna do some of this stuff i'm an orthodontist maybe i'm not gonna um be uh an invisalign provider you know you but but gosh, when you run out of PPE and the, the government tells you to close your offices for two months, um, now um, DSOs, their image is completely changed. And now a lot of people feel safety in numbers. They want to be a part of something bigger. And they're just sick and tired of wearing all the hats by themselves. Do, are you seeing that? Did the pandemic do this uh, in the orthodontic market? I think so. You know, we were discussing this before the pandemic, uh, our practice personally. So that wasn't what necessarily uh, tipped us over per se. Um, For me, it was more of, I think, believing that I could succeed better if I was, you know, like you said, safety in numbers or being with other practices where we could share each other's best practices with each other and and grow with each other as well. we, we, we're trying to lead, uh, as cliche as it may sound, with a really strong clinical focus. So we do have a clinical advisory board. We are sharing best practices. Uh, you know, we, we, we grew our business. When I joined my father's practice, from when I joined 13 years ago to where we are today, we're about six times bigger than we were. Um, so we have significant, you know, growing pains associated with that. And you know, when I, when I wake up, you know, my job is from when I wake up to when I go to bed, it's not, you know, it's not nine to five or whatever. And that, that wears on you. I'm, I'm 41 years old. I'm not uh, by any means my father's age, God bless him. And he's been doing this for how long as he has. Um, but, you know, there has to be some type of a balance there. And so having those uh, 
people behind you that have experience with that to help you manage the practice that have HR resources or that have marketing resources is, is a relief um, and to have guidance in certain scenarios like a pandemic, let's say, where I know practices that we're with orthodontic partners, you know, those, those doctors, you know, they weren't having to figure everything out on their own. You know, during the pandemic, some people were like, oh, this was great. I got to spend time with my family. You know, I was, I was stuck at home for two months. My butt was in this chair every single day. I was at work every single day trying to figure out how to reopen again or how to manage my patients. I was doing virtual calls with patients all day long, you know, figuring out Zoom and Calendly and, and managing how many times are you turning your expander? Are you still wearing your design trays? Change your rubber bands to this, you know, and just managing things. Uh, so that didn't really end for me. But uh, yeah, I think to your point, obviously for some docs that went through 2008 uh, and they held on, you know, and they got to this point now uh, and they figured they could keep maybe working, but this maybe was the, the straw that broke the camel's back. And so there's definitely, I think those practices that are entertaining joining uh, or selling their practices to an OSO. I think the other variable there, Howard, is this though. A lot of us became busier. Um, and I think a lot of dentists and orthodontists just over time, their practices have been growing. And when you start to leverage uh, technology, which has become so pervasive in our profession, the evaluations, I think, of our practices have collectively grown so much that it's really maybe even hard to sell your practice to someone coming out of school. I don't even know how that's a reality for a lot of people who, who can really afford to even buy some of these practices that exist out there. And so their only option at some point may even become to sell it to an organization such as a DSO or an OSO because no one else can really afford to buy their business. Um, so it's just an interesting culmination of things I think that come together with that decision. So Now, is that in, in any relation to uh, Canadian orthodontic partners or is that totally different? Totally different. That's totally different. Wow. Um, my gosh. So you're glad you became a part of, of this uh, new DSO, uh, Orthodontic Partners. You're, it's, it's grown your business. Um, you're, you're a happy camper. And this is what you recommend uh, now for others? I, I am personally. like I'm just going to, you know, this, this was not prompted or scripted, I guess. But, you know, this is, um, for example, they have given us, you know, marketing materials. This is like a referral card now that has things done that they have a marketing department that helps us with this. Well, guess who was doing this beforehand before I joined them? I was having to do all these marketing pamphlets and booklets and so forth. And I don't want to do that stuff anymore. I really want to focus on taking care of my patients. So having uh, those resources behind us, um, they are really focused and centered on taking care of my team which is important. My team has better benefits now because of the ability to leverage. I think, you know, having a group behind us, they have better health insurance. They have um, more vacation, you know, they're, they're being incentivized properly. So yes, I'm very happy. The biggest, I think, transition to that, to be quite frank, is not being the complete control or being the, the boss of everything, you know, having to and I'm not going to say answer anybody because that's not how we work. It's more of like a team, but having more players that we talk to that are in the leadership roles is a transition. That's a learning experience. Uh, but at the end of the day, is it something that is making me sleep better at night because I feel like I, I'm more supported? That answer is yes. And that was really the primary goal of all this was to be more supported and have a more clear path moving forward. They're trying to right now hire an office manager for our practice as well. So supporting us in that role. Uh, to get, again, better, I think, communication and support for the team and to let me be more of a doctor, uh, which is at the end of the day, when you're a small business owner, it's hard to do wear both hats, to actually be the manager of the business and to also be the doctor and to do and excel at both is very taxing. So we're getting all the systems in place that really allow me to just be the orthodontist. But you don't think they'll... Um... You don't think they're interested in adding pediatric dentistry to their business model? No, no, that's not their model at the moment. Uh, for whatever reason, I think they see a much better opportunity. It's almost like, I think, um, getting too many cooks in the kitchen, I guess. They want to just really focus on orthodontics because and understand the, that model inside and out and help that model to grow. And they have, uh, they have what we call, I guess, playbooks in place that will allow us to uh, 
drive more patients into the business without necessarily needing pediatric dentists. Um, so I think that's kind of, it depends on what the model is going to be for that, that practice. The other thing for them, for orthodontic partners, is that they actually don't want to dictate how you manage or see your patients at all. Uh, they want the orthodontist to be the orthodontist. So for example, a guy like me, uh, who does a lot of TMD treatment and orthosurgery and Invisalign, uh, that's not necessarily a pediatric friendly practice. So they don't want to say, hey, you know, you now you have to start seeing all these kids and you can't do TMJ and orthosurgery anymore. That's not our model. That's not how they want to do this. They want to let the orthodontists decide how they want to run their practice, make their own clinical decisions. Uh, so I think that may also play a role in it as well. And then to say that won't change or happen in the future, I have no idea. But at the moment, that's they're strictly looking at orthos only. So, um, you know, Aristotle said the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. We talked about clear choice, oral surgeon, prosthetics, lab tech. We talked about pediatric dentist plus orthodontics. Um, I'm trying to launch my DSO where I'm adding a geriatric dentistry with a crematorium. Um, do you, uh, do you, what do you, what do you think? Do you think? That's been heaven, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, was, uh, uh, that's, that's my idea. Uh, I don't saying all my ideas are good. Uh, but, um, so now do you have, um, um, obviously we're going to post this on ortho town. Um, what does, um, your lecturing do for orthodontists and does any of your, um, stuff that you do at the, uh, Cade at St. Louis university, is any of that for general dentists or are you mostly an orthodontic educator? Educator, because Cade is uh, an orthodontic residency. So I'm lecturing just strictly to orthodontists there. Um, it's part of their curriculum uh, for them actually going through and getting their degree in orthodontics. And then what we do, the Aligner Dental Fellowship is uh, for orthodontics only. That's for our ADA CRP guidelines that it requires two years of specialty training in orthodontics to be able to take the course. Um, so yeah, we've trained over 3000 orthodontists through that program. Uh, I've been teaching at uh, SLU for six years now. Uh, which has been really one of the biggest blessings uh, to do that. It's, it's the thing I look forward to most every week, to be honest with you, when I go there, uh, just being out of the practice and being able to, to talk to them and to, to really feel like I'm giving back. Uh, it's, it's, it's awesome. So I, I do, I do enjoy it. Wow. Um, so what is the, um, what is the next big thing in ortho now? I mean, my gosh. Um, well, I, I, well, let's, let's go to the low hanging fruit. Um, you know, 5,000 years of recorded history. It looks like, you know, um, humans are better served when everybody's transparent as opposed to being opaque and when everybody has competition. And, um, um, I love Germany. It's a slight little, slight little touch, but like Germany versus the United States, United States, um, like Bill Clinton came down on Microsoft and, and all this stuff. He said it was a monopoly. Um, Germany, I like the way they, they do it better. And by the way, they're two thirds of the whole European economy. They just say, we're not going to call it a monopoly, but if we can't figure out who you're competing with and we don't see you training for the big Friday night fight on HBO, if, if we don't see you, uh, really competing hard and scared of something, then we're going to break you up. You know, that, that's how they do it. Competition serves uh, everybody, and um, so the competition uh, would uh, straight to consumer. You have Smiles Direct Club that said, uh, "Forget about um, worried about the orthodontist. Worried about the general dentist is going to start doing ortho. Hell, we're gonna we're gonna take out everybody and just go direct." And it's been a tumultuous uh, journey for those guys. But uh, what do you think of the do-it-yourself ortho, the Smiles Direct Club, and how many of those companies are out there now? I mean, now that the patents are gone, when I when I look around the world, um, I'm seeing over 600 implant manufacturers. 600 companies make a titanium implant. Here's what's weird about culture. 400 of them are in Italy. I don't know what titanium and Italians have in common, but my God, two out of every three original equipment manufacturers of a titanium implant are in Italy. And clear aligners, um, there, there's got to be over 40 on my list of clear liner companies. But So what do you think about, so two questions. What do you think of Smiles Direct Club and the straight to consumer do it yourself ortho, and then and then what do you think about um, the second question? On that is um, 
is Invisalign a brand that you're just uh, loyal to now that the patents have worn off and there's like 40 other clear liner companies? Is there something unique about Invisalign uh, that makes you want to do Invisalign or are you agnostic on that and a clear liner is a clear liner? So awesome questions. Uh, the first one about uh, Smile Direct Club and direct to consumer, there's actually recently, I'm trying to remember what company it was. I want to say it was, uh, I think Dent Supply bought Bite. Uh, so even some of these dental companies are going direct to consumer. So again, I want you can look that up, Howard. I think Dent Supply bought the company Byte, B-Y-T-E, which is uh, direct to consumer orthodontic company. So they basically, because they used to service orthodontists, and they just completely it was like you know middle finger to the orthodontist. We're going straight to the to the consumer now. So that was that tells you a lot about I think the opportunity of going direct to consumer and how it's perceived maybe by the industry. So. The catch-22 there is this. Um, I think what they're doing is they're definitely increasing awareness about orthodontics. Um, you know, orthodontics uh, is, is definitely increasing popularity. We have a lot more adults coming in that are seeking orthodontic care with clear aligners. I think that's probably part of the reason, in addition to, I think, some of the increase in disposable income from the pandemic and kind of the hangover from that, if you want to take care of themselves and the Zoom effect or whatever you want to call it. But clearly... You cannot do appropriate orthodontics without seeing a clinician. And so my opinion of it is it's not ethical, and I think it's detrimental to the patient. Uh, we're seeing, and it's funny because I'm seeing it on now almost every month before it was sparse, but now I'm seeing a lot of retreats coming in. A lot of people that are coming in that had a Smile Direct Club, and they, for whatever reason, they quote unquote say it didn't work. Um, and I could probably give them a litany of reasons why it didn't work, but they're coming in now to get retreated. Majority of these people don't have dentists. So it's like, well, you got to get dental clearance first. Make sure you don't have any active caries, periodontalsies, so on and so forth. Then come back in once you're dentally cleared and we can actually do some proper orthodontics on you. Um, so I think for the profession as a whole, you know, it's, it's probably beneficial to one extent because it's increasing awareness, but also to the profession as a whole, it's diminishing I think our profession by dumbing it down, it, it, it makes it look like you can, you can skip over the dentist and that degrades what we're doing. It, it, it diminishes our importance in terms of oral care. So it's hundred percent a catch 22, but I think the best thing we can do as a profession as dentists and orthodontists is to just continue to educate our patients as to why it's important to see us, what, what, what our role is in the process, why it's important to diagnose and true and plain cases. So that, you know, it's really, Obviously, I think change the profession forever. I'm not sure if it's ever going to go away. I don't believe it will, um, unfortunately. Uh, as it pertains to Invisalign, the product, at the end of the day, uh, you know, we, we kind of use an analogy at times that, uh, you know, if I'm using Nike or Reebok, I'm still wearing a tennis shoe and I'm still going to be able to, to run and jump. But my internal ability is going to ultimately dictate how well I do in those tennis shoes. Uh, and I think to some extent, yes, that does apply to clear aligners. However, um, with Invisalign, that product has been out for over 20 years, and they've had a significant amount of research and development in the product. So if I was to pit it up against a, a comparable, quote-unquote, clear aligner product, I would tell you that I would have to spend a lot more time customizing that clear aligner product to perform to the same level of what I can leverage and scale with Invisalign because of what is actually integrated into the back end with the algorithms and the artificial intelligence from what they've learned from 10,000 or 10, excuse me, 10 million smiles and scans that they've been able to record in terms of data. So I think data is what makes them uh, much more profound as a product than anything else out there in the clear liner market, in my opinion. So what does, so I remember when Invisalign, how do you wrap your head around this when you're um, a clinician first, you're an orthodontist first, you're a board certified orthodontist, and, um, but some company like, I remember when Invisalign started opening up some of their own stores, there were dentists like, ah, it's a last straw, Joe Hogan, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm mad at you, and I'd say, well, did you quit using this product? And they go, well, actually, I, I, ha I have to use it because uh, the thermoplastic is better and blah, 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 blah. So like Densply, they, they buy bite. And um, um, so, you know, they're, they, they got big space in the orthodontic market. Um, yep. Do you think that is something that where orthodontists will say, 
I am so mad, I'm just going to send you a sternly worded letter? Or do you think they're going to quit um, buying or purchasing from... Um, that's what I've been hearing from my colleagues is that they're just going to up and stop because you can go to Patterson, you can go to someone else and get your supplies. Really, in terms of what uh, Dentsply was offering to orthodontists, it wasn't very much. It was, uh, I think, Sure Smile may have been under their purview, uh, I believe, in terms of um, the the wires and the aligners that they were offering. And I'm, I'm not sure if they're integrating that software into Byte to make one company's product. Don't quote me on that. I'm not sure if that exactly is factually true, but I believe that's the case. Uh, but in terms of disposables and other things you get from Dent Supply, you can get from a lot of other companies, and they're probably going to be just as good, if not better. Um, so there's no reason to be married to what they were offering. And I think they made a conscious decision that that relationship didn't really matter to them as a company by doing that. So um, I, I don't think anyone would, would have any type of loyalty to them whatsoever, honestly, because you can get, again, comparable, if not better, products elsewhere. Huh, uh, that is a, um, strategy is everything, isn't it? Um, um, but you know what, the, the guy who says um, strategy is everything, I remember um, my number one business guru was Peter Drucker, and he said, uh, culture always trumps strategy. He says you can have the, the best strategy in the world, and if you don't have the right people on the team, they don't, they're not following, and they're not, you know, the culture and all that kind of stuff. And I, I can't believe we went over an hour, but I, I want to end there on the fact that, um, you know, you're an orthodontist, I'm a general dentist, we, we, we can talk this stuff all day long, but, but when you really get into the mind of a dentist um, um, and you say, what's really bothering you? It's always humans. It's always his own staff or his own customers. And then he goes home and it's his spouse and his kids and, and on and on and on. But um, dentists seem to be, they, they all got to the party because they got A's in math, physics, chemistry, and biology. And then the, the joke is that the guys who sat in the back row and got all the C's uh, that were, you know, jokesters and well-rounded, maybe they're in frats and in girlfriends and parties, they always made the big bucks because obviously um, you're going to do a lot better in life if you're, like you, charming, talkative, personality, than if you are just have your head buried in a book in the library um, do you think this DSO is going to help you with what is the most difficult part of dentistry, and that is uh, managing staff, uh, managing patients, manage, you know, just the whole people thing? I know my dog. I bet your mother is in heaven when she finds the MB2, and she's in, she's in her little operatory, and she's like, oh, my God, I found the pot of gold. It's the MB2, and, and there's no kids, there's no husband, there's no patient, there's no office manager, there's no hygienist waiting to talk to you about a raise, all that stuff. The, 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 the number one problem in all dentist minds is people. Do you think this DSO is going to help you on the people side of business? I, I 100% do, Howard. Uh, I, I talked to two other DSOs before this one, to be honest with you, and I prefer not to mention names, but... Um, SmileWorks and... It had well, to be one of them had to be small works. I mean, come on, we don't, but yeah, anyway. Uh, but but um, with, with this specific DSO, they were, the vision was for me that they were going to help us to share best practices and to become, for one, for me to become a better orthodontist and for two, to be able to run the business better. That was the whole promise of really joining. And to this point up till now, they've kept to their word with that. So two examples uh, again, one, I mentioned already, they're helping with marketing and the ideas to get marketing done. They're helping with uh, instilling an office manager for me. But two, in terms of clinical efficiency, and you're talking about the interaction with humans, one of the things that can plague an orthodontist uh, is having people that are over treatment time. And there's systems that you can put into place to really help facilitate decreasing that because that would make you excessively busy. If you have people that are in your practice too long and then you're dealing with too many people, there's too many people calling your practice, it bogs down your systems. It doesn't really help when you have people coming in that are in treatment for 30 months, but the kid isn't wearing his rubber bands, he's bringing his braces all the time. You know, why is he still in braces if nothing's going to change? You know, there's so many different variables I can add into that, but they're really providing a lot of assistance with some sophisticated data and metrics, analyzing things to come up with suggestions on how to improve what our clinical systems are. I'm doing the same thing uh, in, in turn in terms of maybe how to 
provide better clear liner outcomes. So we're all working as a big team to try to improve our, each other's quality of life. And that's the whole goal of what we're trying to do. We're going to be better as one. So to answer your question, 100%, I believe that's going to provide a better quality of life for me moving forward in terms of how I live and breathe in my practice and how I live and breathe when I go home. Well, on that note, um, my gosh, I um, I hope that you send all your DNA to 23andMe. I think your family alone might be able to find uh, the D gene, the dental gene, uh, or you think your kid will be an orthodontist or an endodontist? Definitely an orthodontist. Is there anybody outside endo and ortho, or are they all one of those? So, well, it's all endo ortho, but my sister's husband is also an orthodontist. My gosh. I met my brother in law is an orthodontist as well. Wow. Now, are you worried at some point it'll turn into inbreeding if it's just orthodontist <laughs> breeding with endodontist? Well, I so mean, now his, and, and his dad and brother are dentists. So there are dentists in the bloodline as well, like kind of distant relatives, though. But I yeah. was in uh, New Delhi, was the record. I was, uh, when I lectured in New Delhi, the dentist took me to his house. There were 35 dentists and his family. But back, but in those worlds, they all lived together, too. Oh. So it's not like all in one house, but every house was next to each other, connected. It was really, really cool. They they called um, Amer- Western uh, love marriages, and over there, they're arranged marriages. And the arranged marriages, they they, they don't even have, they have a divorce rate. Uh, but it was so cool because every kid there could find his grandma, his aunt, whatever the heck. And when, when mom or dad went to work, when mom was a dentist and dad was a dentist, the kids didn't even care. It's like... Dad's going to work, and they're running off to grandma, to grandpa. And then I was in um, um, Brazil. It was in um, that was the largest lecture I ever gave. It was four thousand people at the oh Aesthetica God. two thousand conference. And the dentist I stayed at, I think it was thirty. I, I don't know the exact number. They were both like thirty five, and there were thirty five dentists in the family. But it was like fifty five if you counted laboratory technicians. Wow. I mean, it was just like. And then if you threw in high hygienist, I mean, it was just like. But that's the way it really always has been. Business has always run in families, uh, countries. Like um, you take, um, what is Taiwan known for um, besides uh, semiconductors, but anything fiberglass? Every fiberglass tennis racket on earth came out of Taiwan. I mean, the, the country just does all the fiberglass. And uh, But anyway, um, it was just an amazing, amazing, amazing talking to you. And uh, tell your... Um, Tell um, Jamie Reynolds that um, uh, who co-founded Ortho Phi and now Ortho and Partners. Love to have him come on the show and talk oh. about this because I do think it took a pandemic to get me off the road and it took a pandemic to flip the uh, reality of DSOs that um, that Aristotle was right. The whole is greater than some of its parts and nobody wants to go to war. The only guy standing on the front line with a knife. You you want to go with a tribe and um, this pandemic PPE. Uh, it used to just be the marketing, the all that stuff, but the 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 pandemic was the final straw. Uh, there is safety in numbers, and I think the uh, the pandemic totally turned the image around on DSOs. And I'd love to talk to uh, Jamie about it. So uh, he's, he's one of the brightest people I've ever met. Honestly, you talk to him, he's uh, a wealth of knowledge, extremely well-spoken, obviously has a lot of experience in kind of dealing with what's going on uh, with private equity and transitions of business and so forth. So I think uh, I'll definitely talk to him for you, get him on there. And, and if he's the smartest guy, you know, you know who the least smartest guy is? Seriously? <laughs> Who's that? My dog Mowgli. When I FaceTime him, when I FaceTime him, he doesn't even recognize it. He doesn't even look at the phone. He, he can see my face. I'm yelling. And he's like looking at a fly, a bird go by. I mean, how dumb is my dog that he can't even recognize my face and voice on FaceTime? What kind of a dog? Uh, Mo- oh, Mutt. I mean, he's a mutt? Yeah. mainly boxer. Uh, Rufus and Sammy are little 10-pound dogs. Uh, but uh, Mowgli's a big 40, 50-pound dog. Uh, uh, boxer and his sister's a um, uh, Rottweiler, and I swear to God, not one of them, not one of them will look at the iPhone when wow. you're yelling their name at the top of your voice. So <laughs> just tell Jamie that I know he's at least smarter than my dog. Yeah, <laughs> they'll, they'll get him on the show. <laughs> okay, all right. Have a great day. You too, Howard. Thank you. Take care.